Okay, so where are you today? I'm in New York. You're in New yeah, York. This is, so this is New is, York. What is your connection to Arkansas then? I'm from there. I mean, I was born in Little Rock. I'm from, I grew up in Pine Bluff. And then um, my family all moved. Like we would go to the Ozarks as a kid. We had a cabin there. And then when I got older, um, my dad and my sister, and now actually my mom, a lot of the time live there. So lots of family there, always going back for visits. My grandparents were there before they passed away. So a lot of family there. Holds Cousins a, too. Holds a very yeah. special place in your heart. Oh yeah. 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 My whole family's there basically. So, so yeah. I'm kind of curious, um, what drew you to this case with Ebby? Was it your connection to Arkansas or was it the case in general? Well, it was, it was, it was a lot of things. First of all, so my first case that I was working on the Rebecca Gould case, um, my sister knew Rebecca. And so that was my entrance into that. And, uh, I started to get into Ebby's case when I was investigating Rebecca's case, because I was seeing, it was, it was unfolding at that time. And I remember seeing stuff on the news about it. And then I remember seeing, I really remember seeing Michael and Laurie, uh, both on the news and especially Laurie on Dr. Phil later. And I just thought, like, I just couldn't understand why it wasn't solved and why nothing was happening. And when I, when I heard that her body had been found, I wasn't, I wasn't happy, obviously it's terrible, but at least I thought, okay, now maybe they can get some answers and some closure and then just nothing happened. And so that was what started it. And when we, we, we needed to pick a case for season four of Helen Gone, I just, I wanted to do it. I've wanted to do it for quite a while now. So. Now, you're not only a podcaster, you're also a private investigator. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. So I'm a journalist. Um, I've been a journalist for a long time. And then I guess about 10 years ago, I really wanted to make the transition to investigative journalism. So I got a private investigator license when I was living in California, which is like three years and 6,000 hours, a lot. And then I did a little bit of PI work, but mainly I used the PI work, um, in my journalism because it really helps in terms of, it's just an extra layer. It's knowing which databases to use, um, some of the tactics, things like that. So it's been almost four years now that we're coming up on the anniversary of Evie's being found. Um, and there's still, as you mentioned, little answers. So do you feel like you're any closer to finding answers for the family? I do feel like we're getting closer to finding answers for the family. I'm not going to say we have all the answers. The main frustration that I'd found with Ebby's case, and you see this in a lot of cases, um, is that there's this, there, a lot of media coverage has happened on this case. There's been a lot of media coverage. And yet, when we really started to dig into it, we found that a lot of the things that had been reported were incorrect for a variety of reasons. Um, and just the, some of the story was wrong. And so that's a problem because if the, if the story is wrong, then you don't know what questions to ask or where the investigation is going to go. And so I feel like we were able to clear up a lot of that, um, fill in a lot of the blanks and hopefully get closer to some answers. I want to talk to you about the theory that Ebby put herself in that drainage pipe. That has been, you roll your eyes at it. So I, I kind of would to. like to know your thoughts on that. And where did that theory come from? Well, okay, let me say this. First of all, when I, when I go into any case, one of the criticisms I have, I work really well with law enforcement a lot. Sometimes, you know, they don't love the fact that there's media, I'm sure you've experienced covering things. Um, but with that, I feel like one of, the, one of the ways I really try to be different from people that I criticize sometimes is I really try to keep an open mind. So going into it, I said, okay, could she have gotten in there herself? And it's a fair question. Maybe she had a moment, she was depressed, she was scared, she was running from someone. Um, but then we figured out that that was impossible. I, the, the place where she was found, not only would she have to, first of all, we know she was in an, in an impaired state because she had talked to her brother. She was probably under the influence of something. So, you know, she's in that impaired state. And then you have to believe it's getting dark in that park, in Shalmont Park. She would have had to get out of her car where she was totally safe, leaving all her things behind for some inexplicable reason, pull a very heavy manhole cover off. Or the only other way to go down there is to go into a gutter, which would have been really difficult and would have, you know, really scratched her up, probably would have gotten hurt doing that. Um, then go down to the bottom of the storm drain and then go into a 13 inch wide concrete pipe which you can't even see from the top. You can't see it in broad daylight in the middle of the day. So 
you've just got to ask yourself, is that even plausible? And the answer is no. I think it's absolutely absurd. Not to mention she was not suicidal. She had been upset about things, but also she was seeing friends over the weekend. She went to a friend's house. She went to her grandparents' house. She was talking to people on social media. She was not suicidal. And when she called her brother, she called her brother for help. She wasn't saying, I'm going to end it all. She was saying, come help me. I don't know where I am, basically. Where did that theory come from? Were you told that by someone? I know that it's mentioned in your podcast. Um, yes. Yeah, so where did it start? I mean, I think, I think it was something you've got to consider. So we did consider it. We ruled it out really early on. Um, and uh, the, so let me get this right. So Ebby's mother, um, Lori, has been talking with the new investigator on the case, uh, Bruce. And there was an email sent from Bruce to Lori that said something like, the only conclusion I, and we read it on the podcast, I don't have the exact wording, but it's like the only conclusion that we can come to is that she must, she might've, you know, the, the only thing I can, the only conclusion I can imagine is that she must've crawled down there herself or something like that. Um, he's sort of implying that he believed that that was a, possibility. And at that point, I just thought, you know, I just completely disagree with that. I don't think there's any way that could have happened. And you actually went down there yourself. Yes. I went down there. And so, uh, I am, I'm a lot bigger than Ebby. She was, I'm 5'11". She's about 5'1", but we're about 20 pounds apart in weight. So she was still a lot smaller than me, but, but it's like comparable. So I went in there and when I went into the pipe, the first thing you figure out is that you can't just crawl in. In order to get in that pipe, well, there's only two ways. You either have to put your arms out in front of you like Superman and go in that way, and then you can't move. So who would put themselves there like that? Or the other way, and it's just the same, same situation reversed. Your feet are down there first. Your hands are like this. You can't move. Um, there's just absolutely no way that anyone would put themselves down there like that. Not to mention you would have to know the pipe was down there. You know, I, I kind of keep coming back to that. When you put, when you pull up the manhole cover, we know that, so Abby went missing on Sunday and uh, she went missing on Sunday, October 25th. Her family was out looking for her. Her dad and her, and her stepdad and her brother specifically went to that place on Friday. They lifted the manhole cover and she was not down in that storm drain. So that means that her body was already in that pipe someone put her in that pipe because they knew that pipe was down there. And to know that pipe is down there, you have to know that park really well. It's not the kind of thing you just stumble on at all. Do you have, do you have any theories about what happened to Abby? Do you think you know who killed her? Um, I wouldn't go that far, but I would say we have, I definitely have a couple of people who's, I, have, I definitely have a couple of people who have questions about there are stories that are not matching here. And what I don't accept is when the investigators say, oh, this is where, you know, the investigation, it's, it's a stopping point. It's not. There is at least one person whose story absolutely does not match, needs to be checked out. Not saying this person did anything, but I am saying you've got to look into this. If you've got a person who's giving information to the police, we're finding inconsistencies, you need to check it out. My theory right now um, is that she, my theory right now she was obviously on something. Um, I don't know if that was alcohol. Maybe she'd been smoking pot, um, maybe some other type of drug. And it really could have been, this is right when fentanyl was kind of becoming a big deal in Little Rock. It could have been even something she took accidentally. But whatever she took put her in a state that she was clearly in trouble. She needed help. Um, I think that she possibly could have been with some of the friends who we identify. We know she was at the park with these people um, at different times. And I think they may know that she was there that day and not be coming forward. But in terms of the actual position of the body, I really believe that it's possible someone stumbled upon her in that, you know, someone found her when she was vulnerable and in that state and either took advantage of her or maybe confronted her and things went wrong. And then at that point, they needed to cover up what they did and they put her in the pipe. Do you give this information that you find to police? And if so, what is their response to you? Yes, I have given it to police. I have given information to the police little by little um, and not always everything. Also, I give a lot of the information to Abby's mom. She talks to the police. So I know that the police are getting this information one way or another. And um, to be honest, it's been 
it depends on the investigator. Some investigators are open and receptive to receiving it. Other investigators sort of have tried to not shut it down, but just sort of like, for example, um, the security guard I had questions about. And uh, I said to, well, so I was speaking to, you know, Abby's mom and she's talking to the investigator. And he said, she, she said, well, has anyone, you know, check this person out? And he said, well, uh, he's, had his, he's had a background check because you have to have a background check to be a security guard. That would be the answer. And to me, that's not an acceptable answer because it's just, don't you want to check it out? Don't you want to know? Don't you want to dig into this and see if, if there could have been something someone missed? Because, I mean, not to criticize anyone, but obviously there's something someone missed because if there wasn't, the case would be solved. So, yeah, I, I've, it just depends. So how much longer do you think you have for this podcast? Um, and do you think we'll see some real answers by the end of it? Because you're kind of doing this podcast as the investigation is going on. Yeah, well, we're finished with the season. We just finished. Um, but I've said I'm not going to stop our investigation. We're keeping our tip line open. Um, and we're also, now that the podcast has been out for a while, plus we get a lot of new listeners who sort of binge everything at the end. You know, they like to hear everything at once. So we're getting a lot of people coming forward now. I, I really feel like the case was sort of stuck. Uh, it was in a place where a lot of people thought, okay, Ebby had contact with some people. Um, on Everyone knew about Friday night when she went out and um, you know there was this enca sexual encounter with a guy. She got concerned that he might've filmed it without her consent. Um, and then she was sort of back and forth over the weekend with a couple of these guys. Um, everyone kind of knew that, that she might have had conflict with a person from Friday, but that's where the story stopped. There's no understanding that there was a completely different group of people who she went to the park with. She had other plans on Saturday. Saturday night is a big question mark. And we've also just recently learned um, from the police that they apparently had their timeline wrong. So all this time, they've been telling uh, Abby's mom that they knew exactly where she was on Friday night and Saturday night. They just didn't know on Sunday. Um, for a small period of time. And now, of course, they're saying, okay, actually, they seem to be saying we don't know where she was on Saturday night. And to me, that's a huge piece of the puzzle, because that's, that's obviously so crucial. That's the period right before, you know, right before she went missing. So, you know, what would you like to see come out? Do you think there's going to be a second season? Just because the season's over, do you, is your work going to continue? What's the plan from here? Oh yeah. I mean, we're absolutely going to continue with this case and I think we'll definitely do updates as they come along. I don't know if we'll do a whole nother season. It just depends. We could, but we will definitely be doing updates on the case as they become available. Um, and I just, I mean, I, it just feels to me like a lot of people are coming forward now. There's a lot of new information coming out and it does feel like the kind of case where it, something could happen at any minute because also we're not talking about that long ago. Um, but enough time has passed that people might have gotten a little older now. Maybe they're, they've had kids of their own. They feel differently about things than they did when they were maybe 17. And people might be more willing to come forward now. And, and that's all it takes. All it takes is one person sometimes. Emmy's mom had mentioned to me too, um, you know, her wish is for these people, the, the people that you interviewed you or you attempted to interview to come forward and be questioned by police, just as she and her uh, Evie's stepfather were. Uh, oh, yeah. And that's what she's she's pleading for. Um, I mean, that, that people come forward. I absolutely agree with her. Um, and not just quite. I, I believe that everyone look. As after Evie's body was found, the case changed direction or should have. It, it became about who was around Chalamont Park that day and the day before. So yes, everyone in the same way that Laurie and Michael were questioned, you know, they were tracked, um, they were, ge um, they, you know, police used geolocation to figure out where they were. In the same way they did that with Michael and Laurie, they should be doing that with everyone who was around the park that day. And I mean, everyone, because this is still, this information is still out there. It's still with the phone companies. It's still probably with Google. And it's just, it's so frustrating that, that it just feels like we're missing one piece. I said on the podcast, it feels like the end of the usual suspects where you're backing up from the board and everything starts to kind of come into frame. It just feels like we're missing one piece. And 
I would, I would love it if um, the people who maybe over the years have been mentioned in connection with this case would talk because I understand that not everyone wants to talk to the police for a variety of reasons, but the truth is, you know, un until people are publicly cleared, their lives are affected too. I mean, they're having to walk around with their names getting whispered and things like that. And, and that's not right either. What should have happened is everyone should have been, their phones should have been, sorry, their phones should have been searched. They should have been properly questioned. Their, uh, everything should have been geolocated um, and their location should have been verified. If that had happened, I believe this case would have been solved very quickly. And that's even, you know, not to mention, obviously, her body should have been found a lot sooner. And my last question to you is this case right now is classified as a homicide. But when we go back to what you were told, that this theory of Evie putting herself in there, how does that stand up to what this case is classified as? Well, OK, so I haven't seen the case file, obviously, because they don't share any information, um, which I understand. My understanding, I've heard different things. I've asked the question directly many times. I've never quite gotten a totally straight answer. I believe that they said um, that they're investigating it as a homicide until they rule it out, which probably means it's undetermined. They don't know. Um, I, I would agree with that. My, my, I agree with Tommy Hudson. I agree with the investigator who said the main reason, um, barring any other forensic evidence you'd investigate as a homicide is because of where the body was. She couldn't have put herself there. And so then, you, and, and also the way the car was found and just a lot of circumstances around there that to me really suggest a staged crime scene. You've got a towel coming out of the door. You, it, it looks like someone put her down there and we need to know who put her down there and why. And that's obviously the goal. And I hope you figure that out. I really do. Thank you. I just want to, I, I really want to get justice for them. I mean, Lori has been such an inspiration to me and to everyone um, working on the case. Every time I get the podcast edit back, someone's crying. It's just, it's, it's really touched a lot of people and we just want to get answers and justice. And I really believe it's not, I mean, I really believe the answers are out there somewhere. We just need a few more people to come forward.